Well, good evening, everybody. I had to change my script from good afternoon to good evening. Uh, and thanks so much for joining us today on a Friday at Secular AZ. Um, and again, if you are joining us on this webinar or you're on Facebook, please feel free to put your name in the chat and let us know who you are, why you're here, and why this kind of topic is important to you. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade. As you've all been paying attention, we have great programming. Our Friday updates from speakers all over the world, including historians, authors, elected officials, journalists, etc., um, next Friday, you can join us for a discussion of the, we're taking a little break. So tonight is the end of our discussion about secular solutions to, um, you know, helping our unhoused neighbors. Um, and so next Friday, we're going to kind of take a little break as we transition, but we're going to have Carol Burris. She is the executive director of the Network for Public Education. I'm actually going to be presenting at their conference, which is happening um, in the end of October. So you can learn more about them. I'm sure that Lindsay right now is furiously like looking for those links and putting them up there. Um, but she is going to be talking about, um, you know, these right wing charter schools and how they're cropping up and the ties between that and the private school uh, movement that we see happening in our state, which is ground zero. So I really enjoyed doing these thematic discussions. And if you have a topic that you'd really like for us to tackle, I'd love for you to put it in the chat or put it in the Facebook chat, wherever. Um, but we definitely wanna hear your thoughts. And if you are interested in getting more involved with our little organization, we're looking for volunteers to help with our school board support initiative. And we're also looking for folks to fill some of our board director, board of director vacancies. So if that's something that interests you, I'm sure Lindsay's probably putting those forms right into the chat as well. But today we have an incredible guest. Manuel Mejido Castoya's work explores how civil society, business, and government can better partner to address developmental, I'm sorry, development challenges and social justice issues in both rich and poor countries. He collaborates with and studies faith-based organizations from this perspective. Uh, he's ha he has held teaching and research appointments in the United States, Switzerland, and Chile, and has worked for the United Nations in Bangkok and Geneva. I mean, can you believe the speakers that we get? Currently, he is a visiting professor in Islamabad, Pakistan, where he is also consulting on strengthening community community responses to rapid urbanization. Wow, such important topics. Uh, he has been the lead author of a number of UN reports. His research has appeared in journals like Politics and Governance, Social Compass, and the European Journal of Development Research. His presentation tonight will draw on the collected volume he edited, Land of Stark Contrast, Faith-Based Responses to Homelessness in the United States, published by Fordham University Press in 2021. So Manuel, Thank you for joining us. Is there anything in your uh, resume that I missed? No, it was perfect, Jeannie. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, I'm going to hand it so right much. over to you then. Okay. okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Well, uh, good evening. Thank you, Jeannie and Lindsay, for the invitation uh, to present uh, to you some ideas here. Let me do the sh uh, screen sharing function. It's this one here. Okay, here we go. So you have here... The title of my presentation is, you have here basically the idea that I'd like to discuss with you, kind of, uh, and it's basically this idea that uh, uh, partnering with religion to tackle homelessness is a way of going beyond the culture wars. So I wanna contrast here, this the, the notion that faith-based organizations are important uh, partners, implementing partners in addressing concrete social problems such as housing and securing homelessness, and that by working together with these faith-based organizations, organizations such as Secular Arizona and others, can basically address homelessness and by so doing uh, take, take religion beyond culture war. And so what I present here is two ideas here of religion. And I'm drawing here on the work of a well-known American sociologist, Seymour Martin Lipset, 
uh, that wrote about American exceptionalism. And he wrote about it not in uh, American exceptionalism in, in the normative sense, but in the kind of descriptive sense of the fact that the United States was in many ways an outlier compared to other rich countries, in particular Western Europe. And one of the ways that it was an outlier is the particularly important role that religion played in, in the United States, in the, in the US public life from the beginning. And that this was different than the secularizing tendencies in Western European countries. And, but what, what, what Martin Lipset uh, and, and suggested is that this is a double-edged sword because while religion can help uh, generate pluralism and is at the heart, many sociologists have argued, of voluntary associations in the United States, these religious congregations in the early years of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the United States being uh, anti-elitist, anti-hierarchical, uh, set the stage for voluntary associations. Someone like uh, the French um, diplomat, uh, um, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Tocqueville basically made this argument that th that you, that religion in the United States was fundamental for pluralism. But on the other hand, it also has a kind of negative side that it can create polarization, that there's a tendency to moralize, which verges on intolerance. So religion linked social controversies. So I, I, I appreciate this, this kind of way of thinking about religion. And the research that I wanna share with you today, which is based on uh, several years of, of researching uh, faith-based organizations in the greater Seattle area in Puget Sound and addressing housing and insecurity and homelessness, basically focus on the pluralism side. And I'm gonna frame that for you in a bit. So this idea that religion is important for a vibrant civil society, a pluralistic civil society, and in an ability to problem solve and address local problems. Contrasting that with its tendency to be to, to polarize. And I know that secular Arizona, just reading a, a bit uh, of, of your work, you have been addressing with this polarizing nature. And what comes to mind is is something like obviously the case of Christian nationalism, white Christian nationalism. Uh, so I, let me just say a couple of words about polarization to, to kind of put it aside and then return to pluralism. And I think that in terms of the polarizing tendencies of, of religion as manifested in Christian nationalism, we have to distinguish between uh, Christian nationalism, which has been there from the beginning, that is as, as an establishment ideology, the so-called city upon a hill, that many have critiqued as early as Mark Twain critiquing the U.S. presence in the Philippines, Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, more recently, someone like the economist Jeffrey Sachs has been writing about this. I think that the, and that's a Christian nationalism has been around for a long, the discussions about Christian nationalism and establishment ideology has, has been around in the States for, for, for a long time. And, and the polarizing tendencies is, is the role of the United States in, in the world. But the Christian nationalism that is being discussed today is really one that is linked to questions of anti-establishment populism. And the argument would go that there's a, many say that the right to dissent, which was also at the heart of religion. So there is that whole aspect of Christian, uh, of the polarizing elements of religion that really gets to this idea of the culture wars. And the way framing the culture wars that, that, that is a kind of a way to transition to the research that I did is that many, uh, a number of, of individuals have been talking about cultural wars or, you know, from a kind of a right perspective or what it is identity politics or woke capitalism. Uh, the, uh, the question is whether, to what extent the, is this really, at, uh, you know, is this a distraction or a diversion, maybe by government, maybe, maybe by corporate power, to move away from more concrete uh, kind of structural material issues, like, for example, issues of housing and security. So, the, again, polarizing uh, the, the, the idea of 
of in religion and engaging culture wars and discussing kind of different cultural views or values really moves away from questions such as these here. Like for example, shifting economic paradigms that are driving inequality in the states. These kind of issues, right? The, the, this dichotomy between in innovation economy and deindustrialization, or more focused on the research that I conducted in, in, in the Puget Sound region, this not growing inequalities between regions, but growing inequalities within cities. Well, and the citing, seeing here Seattle, but also Phoenix. I know that you're based in Phoenix. So this whole idea to what extent, is there a correlation between you know these booming tech hubs and um, uh, growing housing insecurity and homelessness, right? So whether it's so, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Silicon Sound or Silicon Desert. So this is how we framed it, and, and linked to that, you have, for example, these structural issues that are really uh, present in the states where you have, uh, you know, growth without good jobs. So that productivity has more than uh, is, has grown six times more than wages because national income is, is mainly moves towards the the share of national income that that is from wage from from labor has is less and less. So that's one aspect. The good jobs. Another aspect, which I'm sure you've read about, is the so-called deaths of despair, right? Which is being driven by the questions of deindustrialization and lack of good jobs. I know. Uh, so the deaths of despair, deaths from um, suicide, opioids, and um, and um, uh, alcohol, which has been increasing disproportionately particularly for midlife working class white non-Hispanic Americans. When compared to the red trend line, you see that in the states white non-Hispanic in the United States compared to the other OECD countries, they've been, uh, excuse me, the rich Western countries such as France, Canada, et cetera, have, has been decreasing. And then also in, in this context of uh, these structural material kind of questions that really cultural wars really do not, uh, did not really engage is the whole question of home ownership on the decline, rental housing on the rise, rent increases are outpacing income growth, and just institutional investors are profiting from, from this. So this the whole question of the housing crisis, which has been very well documented. So these are the, the kind of the structural issues that my work focused on from the framework of pluralism that really, when you're thinking about religion, and the culture wars, its role in culture wars and its polarizing kind of uh, aspects, really, we're not looking at the potential of religious actors to work with other uh, community actors to address concrete problems. Let me say a couple of words here. Let me frame a bit the research by focusing uh, not on the, uh, so moving away from the polarization aspect to the pluralism aspect. And just a way of thinking about American secularism, which I think is helpful, um, is basically if you're focusing on, uh, so there's a kind of diverse, there are two kind of types of pluralism that we have to take into consideration when thinking about pluralism. And here I, we use as a framework uh, the twin religion clauses that I cite there. So you have the establishment clause and the free exercise clause, which is very unique to the United States. And from those, you can map out two different types of pluralism. The establishment clause, that no law respecting an establishment of religion, really frames the re religious secular pluralism aspect. And that's really linked to th this kind of uh, separationist model of, for example, of French laicite. That is one aspect that the founding fathers brought into this kind of the First Amendment. But there's a second aspect that I blended that uh, is, is the free exercise aspect, which is linked not to the religious secular kind of tensions, but to, to the multi-religious pluralism, the pluralism between religious traditions, right? So the two different types of pluralism and that, that type of free exercise clause has really its heritage in the, it, it's really linked to the kind of the, the Nordic Protestant kind of notion of blurring the religious and secular boundaries. So let me just briefly say, illustrate or kind of flesh out a bit these two different types of pluralism. 
so that then I can focus on exactly how I discuss pluralism in my work. So looking at the religious secular pluralism, we can see just the case of the different shifts in religion uh, jurisprudence in the in in uh, uh, by kind of chief justice era, right? And you see that there's a that this illustrates the the kind of the contested kind of pluralistic nature of how religion and secular kind of uh, there's a exchange between religion religious and secular kind of frameworks. You no, know, and we see clearly that. Uh, there has been an increase in pro-religion outcomes in religion cases when you move from the earlier Warren and Berger kind of uh, courts to the Rehnquist and and and, 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 and in, in particular the the Roberts court. But what one one dynamic that I think uh, is important that I was that has been mentioned is that while it, we see in the left the leftward kind of element of the religious secular pluralism, we see that. During the Warren and Berger years, when religion, when there was a pro-religion kind of case, it was more protecting minority dissenting religious groups. While increasingly, in particular, in the Roberts Court, what you're seeing is accommodating mainstream Christian values organizations. So I think it, that is one kind of tension that is one way of getting at pluralism. Why? Well, well, perhaps in the years to come, there'll be a shift back to the left. No, this is this kind of give and take in terms of the, the religious secular pluralism. Another kind of aspect, another pluralism is the multi-religious pluralism that has been at the center of U.S. civic uh, life. And here I, I provide two examples of two different models of, of engaging in, in, in civic life. Uh, one is, you know, the, the kind of the more evangelical model on the left of rescuing broken individuals, very important role of the, the gospel missions. And the other is the more kind of Protestant, uh, prophetic, or mainstream transforming unjust systems. So here too, you have a kind of pl a contested pluralism, not between the religious and the secular, but between different understandings of the role of religion in civic life. Now, my the research that I focused on takes those two aspects and really frames it in a more specific way and looks at the role of how religious pluralism contributes to democratic experimentalism. I'm drawing here on the work of John Dewey's notion of democratic experimentalism, which is basically the idea that democracy is about problem solving. A, a, a plurality of, of individuals, of organizations, attempt to solve concrete social problems. So the idea here was that faith-based organi organizations are, are, are serving as important community problem solvers. Uh, the research uh, basically shows in the Puget Sound area, and maybe this is something we can discuss, is that do you see this also uh, in, in, for example, uh, in, 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 the, in the Southwest as well? Uh, so here the idea is experimenting with how to implement innovative solutions to tackle homelessness in partnership with other stakeholders was the framework that we use, that notion of pluralism. And let me just kind of, kind of, uh, provide a, a more, uh, say a bit more about this kind of, how do we understand democratic experimentalism as opposed to, so this pluralism through democratic experimentalism as opposed to polarization, right? Which gets to culture wars. So one, one, I, one uh, uh, element here is that, we, is that democratic experimentalism, that framework, we, we shift from individual religi religiosity to faith-based organizations. And when that, when when looking at faith-based organizations, we look at two different types. There are two different types: the, the congregations and the and the larger faith-based nonprofits. And when you look at studies of religion in, in civic life, there, it seldom do you see uh, a study that tries to bring both of these frameworks together. But when you're, in fact, when you're looking at how faith-based organizations are attempting to to address homelessness, housing insecurity. What, what you see often is that these uh, congregations of faith-based organizations, faith-based nonprofits, work cl work closely together. Okay. Now this uh, this is an important point here, which is that normally when we think about the role of religion, maybe uh, religious of uh, civil society organizations in general, what we're thinking about is either contestation of deliberation and not necessarily implementation. But what what I focused on. I'm thinking about democratic experimentalism, the role of religion is really implementing. So 
by contestation, we, 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 we mean that uh, faith-based organizations and other civil society organizations mobilize as critics of government through community organizing, adv advocacy campaigns against removal of, of unsanctioned and, and, and encampments and lobbying uh, legislation that's unfavorable to, you know, that creates housing crisis and the like. That's one model, the contestatory model of civil society, which is very important. Right? There's, a, there's another model, which is one of deliberation, which here religious organizations and other civil society organizations tend to build consensus through dialogue. Okay? So faith-based organizations will mobilize to engage in interfaith gatherings, testimonials, uh, statements against homelessness. That's another model. And th these two kind of pathways are really linked to what I have here in the bottom, this notion of social capital. I contrast that drawing on certain um, scholars in this area, contrast that in particular, uh, Xavier Briggs, I, I contrast that social capital with civic capacity, which is actually the capacity to implement initiatives through collective problem solving. So it's this is the role of, for example, faith-based organizations rolling out tiny house villages or a permanent shelter or a safe parking program on religious land. So I hope you can appreciate the link, the, the the difference conceptually here are, is just an example of each of contestation, deliberation, and implementation. The work I did focused on implementation. Okay, so I focus, I give you here an example of the Al Qaeda United uh, Church of Christ, which worked with a secular uh, organization, Camp Second Chance, to build tiny houses. Camp Second Second Chance is a, a sanctioned in, encampment in. In, 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 in King County, Seattle. And so building, actually building tiny houses, that, contra that, that is a different type of, of engagement than the also very important deliberation, such as passing the declaration concerning homeless, homeless sisters and brothers, you know, this kind of ethical normative voice and the contestation going to Olympia, going to your state government, to advocate and lobby for changes in policies and certain laws. So I focused on implementation. And again, going back to, the, to what I stated at the outset, this idea of implementation together, working with faith-based organizations uh, as implementing partners really is a way of kind of short-circuiting, uh, I would argue, the kind of the, the, uh, the, sh the stoking of kind of cultural wars and polarization. Now, let me end. Let me end with three examples from the research that focuses on this implementation uh, kind of aspect. And you'll notice that these examples, two of the examples have bring together two different types of, 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 uh, of religious kind of the role of religion in public life. And the third one really focuses on religion, secular kind of distinction. So one example of seeing how in, in the Puget Sound region, um, faith-based organizations are engaging homelessness that they're turning to community economic development strategies, right? So instead of, you know, they're, they're trying to grapple with how to find um, long-term solutions, sustainable solutions to housing crisis, housing and security and homelessness. So one way is turning to community economic development strategies. And I contrast here two different uh, kind of... Uh, Two different kind of projects. One is the one on the left is the the religious land redevelopment. So many uh, uh, churches are trying to re develop religious land and turn it into kind of affordable housing. That is the case with St. Luke's Episcopal Church in the Ballard neighborhood, which is an ongoing project of building affordable housing on on church land. That's one model. The other the other the St. Luke's St. Luke's Episcopal Church is more kind of the main mainline kind of church. The other one that's linked more to the evangelical is New Horizons Ministries, which is a nonprofit organization which focused on creating social business to get young uh, homeless individuals off the street. So they created the street bean coffee shop where they basically through that street bean kind of social business, they train um, they train their homeless youth who also, they provide housing to. So these are two different contrasting, but yet what they have in common is that they're implementing initiatives, implementing kind of solution, trying to implement initiatives 
to address these problems. The second pathway is really the role of faith-based organizations attempting to kind of enhance the delivery of social services. So to patch up, you know, to, to improve the, the kind of, to, to overcome the kind of gaps in the, the social safety net. And here, one thing that I don't have time to get into, but it's very important and it's very relevant today in terms of the whole theory of community development and, and the like, is this, the, the increasing role that local knowledge is, is seen as playing and that religion is, a, is an important kind of source, uh, an important way of kind of bringing forth local knowledge that can enhance and even correct kind of specialized scientific or technocratic knowledge. So there are two ways here, two different kind of organizations that we looked at. Uh, the uh, One was uh, the Everett Gospel Mission, which attempted to improve the targeting and delivery of social services. This is uh, basically the Everett Gospel Mission was working, was collaborating with Snohomish, uh, the municipal government of Snohomish County to develop these paranavigator initiatives, which would place paranavigators in, in, in faith communities in congregations to allow them to provide to serve as resources, referrals to individuals that are attempting to access social services. As you know, there are many social services out there that individuals are not aware of. So this is one kind of aspect. And notice that this every gospel mission, which is clearly in the evangelical tradition, is collaborating with uh, with uh, with it, with government. Something that certain studies that focus more on individual religiosity basically uh, overlook. And then this, a second kind of, um, another case study is by Muslim, Muslim Housing Services in Seattle, and they were basically trying to enhance the quality and coherence of, of and effectiveness of social services. So what they were trying to roll out, they, they, they help many uh, uh, refugees and first and second generation immigrants they provide housing services to them, but what, what they were trying to rule out was a job placement program in order to find a sustainable kind of a, a path to greater security for their clients. Uh, this is uh, goes back to the kind of the, the whole problem of, of good of good jobs that we discussed earlier. And finally, this is the example of a kind of religious secular kind of collaboration. And it's this idea that one thing that we saw in working with these organizations, with these with these uh, these groups, was that increasingly a lot of these secular non-sectarian organizations were seeking to foster partnerships with FBOs, and then really moving beyond like the more traditional advocacy support creation and volunteers, and really trying to to create kind of meaningful kind of long-term implementing kind of kind of uh, implementing pro rolling out programs. So one example was from the Puget Sound healthcare system, which uh, one of its units was trying to work with that faith-based organizations to find a way to better serve the, the homeless veterans in the community. And then the second one uh, case study was Housing Development Consortium, which is a large development consortium, which for a long time thought of FBOs more in terms of uh, more advocacy aspects when they were trying to address uh, uh, affordable housing, but increasingly, what they were, what they realized is that how that the consortium, the housing development consortium, can actually serve as an important uh, kind of resource for congregations that were interested in in land redevelopment. So collaborating with th these organizations and providing them with with the technical knowledge and and the resources that they lack. So um, I will stop here for now, and I'm look forward to to our conversation. Thank you very much. Well, so far, we don't have any questions uh, that are coming up in the chat, but I'm sure <clears throat> that they'll start, you know, dropping some comments in there. Um, let's see. I like so we have we have an organization out here called um, the Arizona Faith Network. Right. And and so many like, you know, so many of these organizations that exists to help our unhoused neighbors are faith-based organizations, but they are more of a collective, I guess, of um, really, for lack of a better word, like liberal progressive kind of, you know, um, like they're not, they're not like, uh, you know, these other huge mega churches that we see where, 
and 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 the, the, there was a slide that you put together where it was kind of like okay this is this is the basic like the most basic thing that you can do to actually like here we can we have tiny homes now right. um and so it's it's tough here in Arizona trying to think about solutions for what do we do? I have two children who are in their 20s and housing is skyrocketing over mm -hmm. the last like five, 10 years. It's awful. Um, and then in, on this call right now is Sheila Kruger, who was actually a guest a few weeks ago. She started an organization called Atheists Helping the Homeless, and she has a comment here, Atheist Helping the Homeless has been partnering with Trevor's Vision, a faith-based group with a shower truck. Showers mm -hmm. and toiletries, hygiene items is a, such a great pairing. So it's more of a comment than a question. And then she goes on to say, our next giveaway, oh great. So if people want to do some activism this Labor Day weekend, their next giveaway is tomorrow at 8 a.m. Grace Lutheran Church, 3rd Street and Moreland. Um, which is the south side of Margaret T. Hans Park, which is a, a park that, you know, there's a lot of unhoused people who come. Mm. So um, those are just a couple of comments. So if you do have any questions, please, by all means, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one of the other things that I've noticed happening here, Manuel, is uh, there have been a few organizations, oh gosh, and maybe Lindsay will be able to put their link in there, but there is a group where they are um, converting hotels mm -hmm. into into um, housing for unhoused neighbors. Is that something that you've seen happen um, in in the various places where you've done this research? Put a, ho a hotel? Yeah, taking old hotels, motels, right? You know, that are just, right. kind of, yeah. So, I, so we focusing in basically the role of religious faith-based organizations in the states really the big issue and, and there are organizations that specialize in this is the whole religious land redevelopment so taking for different you know it's they're not being used as much because of you know there are less people that are going to church and they have a lot of land so they want to do they want to use this land so they want to redevelop it into a housing project affordable housing project and there are there's a whole kind of uh, sector in the states that focuses on religious land redevelopment. There are organizations out there that can help you. Because, you know, you can imagine you're a small church. You don't have the technical knowledge, which is one of the kind of things that we saw. So you, how do you learn to do it? So you, you, you basically work with these developers that are focused on kind of doing justice to kind of the the kind of the ethical kind of the moral kind of aspects that you bring to the religious land redevelopment that's something i've seen that's very specific in the states that i think is something that has been growing in recent years i and love that. i think it's very interesting actually i do too and you know we there's a it's the west valley unitarian universalist church and i actually spoke there I presented there back in like 2022, and I just recently found out that that church is now defunct. You know, when I went right. there, their congregation was just dwindling. And that's right. yeah, and and so that's that's such an interesting thing. There is a question coming from Christina. Okay. Christina says, "What if anything is an example of an obstacle to secular and faith-based uh, collaboration?" Right. Right. So I guess, thank you for that. That I mean, I think there are, in terms of, like, I, I focus, the, what I focused on, again, is this idea of different partners in a community coming together to try to, to address for the housing problem in, in Seattle or, and, and so, they come at it from different perspectives, but what what they do have is the kind of the commitment to try to concretely address and rule something out. And so I, so my whole kind of, and this is this is kind of at the at the center of the kind of, you know, John Dewey's notion of democratic experimentalism is that sometimes um, it's distracting when we're what we're focusing on is just having debates about values and you know differences that's those are important and they have their place 
but there is also the idea that in a pluralistic society, we can agree to disagree and that, okay, let's focus on addressing a concrete problem. And maybe by focusing and working together, we learn better to get along. Mm -hmm. we and more, and more right. importantly, like focusing on the solution, right? Like, because right. I feel like people it's, and we do a lot of work with, you know, we're, we're tracking what's happening at school boards and some of these school board members are real quick to point out the problems, but not so much about working exactly. to come up with solutions. That's exactly right. The problems. And then like from, and, and, you know, these are, uh, it's not to be dismissive of, you know, it's, it's more that there is an interesting debate that's taking place. You have individuals such as, you know, just focusing on U.S. electoral politics for a bit, coming elections, you have Cornell West, you have uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, these individuals, they are saying, well, you know what? Culture wars maybe are in a distraction and we need to focus on, you know, solving the structural material aspects. And and I hear again, everyone always, it's not being, this. it's not, that it's, there are differences and it's important to have differences and discuss them, but to what extent are they being used and even cynics was say being weaponized to move us away from addressing problems. Someone like Glenn Greenwald, you know, the, the journalist, Glenn Greenwald, the, uh, the, he's the one that, that collaborate, well, that basically worked with um, Edward Snowden to release the uh, his uh, his uh, his information. He's been working a lot on this kind of this analysis that I find very compelling, mm -hmm. um, and I I also find very uh, compelling someone like Cornell West, who from the le the left will say, you know what, identity politics, yeah, that has its place, but let's work together to create a better society. Yeah. Um, there's a really, really good question coming from Mars. Uh, Mars is one of our local activists here in Arizona. And they say, I can see secularists wanting to partner with religionists because they have the resources and money. Why would religionists want to partner with secularists? Yeah. No, thank you very much. I um I think in a in a democratic society, in an open society, we need to folk we need to being a citizen is to basically work together with individuals to solve problems. So it's really I really do think that that kind of if you have that, ethos to focus on community so pro problem solving then you will work with all individuals regardless of what their you know comprehensive doctrine what their kind of religious or secular worldview is to address concrete problems and i and and again i emphasize that this is very much at the heart of what is called american pragmatism you know, mm -hmm. this is Amer this is very, very, this is very American, you know, and I say this from having, you know, worked in different parts. This, it's this idea of it's it's linked also to dissent. It's distrust of absolute and absolute kind of claims and the idea that you can no longer learn by doing. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is at the heart of 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 the the American kind of uh, uh, tradition, um, and just empirically, you do see um, you do see. Uh, I mean, uh, we saw one thing that for people that study these things, if you read the research on, you know, the evangelicals in public life, like what you see is that oh, they're you know they're very suspicious about government. Government's the problem, not the solution. They don't work with government. But what, we've, what we saw time and time again, I cited the Everett Gospel Mission case, is that they're working with local government. And the local government is working with them. And so th there's interesting collaboration and that is there. And perhaps it's the framing of it 
in a, in a way that kind of dismisses it because we want to say, you know, before the fact that they're going to act in such and such a way that basically moves us away from actually moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and in, in here in Arizona, we see it all the time. You know, first of all, I don't know if this is still the case, but like Mesa, Arizona used to be number two only to Salt Lake City with regards to the number of uh, Latter-day Saints Mormons, right? Yes. And so a lot of, I feel like a lot of, and I've lived here for now, what, 30, almost 32 oh. years. Our government here does, you know, I mean, first of all, we have streets and, <laughs> you know, buildings and all kinds of things named after these like prominent Mormon families, but it, it there's a there's a different kind of approach. It seems I don't know it, 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 these these politicians who ascribe to that religious ideology tend to have some really kind of cruel stances when it comes to dealing. Like as a matter of fact, so I'm thinking specifically this legislative session in our state legislator le state legislature where we had a, a committee member who was a Democrat who referred to the, the homeless population in Arizona as our unhoused neighbors. That's right. And a self-ascribed, you, know, um, you know, Christian right. said, I find offense, they're not my neighbors. Right. Drug users, they're criminals. They're yes. like, you know, and, and it was just like, she couldn't have said, anything that was less that's christian right. <laughs> you know what i mean i know yes i think that's i think that's the kind of the polarizing kind of element i mean individual like like the the sociologists in the states that like have like this idea that religion you know there are there are individuals like 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 um uh, um what's his name robert putnam or um uh, robert wuth these individuals that are saying you know religion is a positive force in u.s public life basically say yeah, religion has has a polarizing effect, but it's a, it's pop, it's pluralizing effect outweighs the polarizing effect, and they try to argue in that way. I mean, I think this is open for debate. Uh, the only what I focus on, and it's work that I do, like say in the global south, where you have just to tie it in here, uh, you know, the UN a more secular, bureaucratic Western organization, the largest international organization for many years is the epitome of, you know, secularization. That, that basically, you know, no, we don't work with faith-based organizations. It's divisive, but increasingly they are working in order to realize, you know, the sustainable development goals. They realize that faith-based organizations are important, have, are important partners. So we need to find a way to, given though we have differences, how can we put those differences aside and address concrete problems? I think that I think is the the, the main challenge uh, uh, that uh, that religion that the main challenge is is really focusing putting away the kind of the 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 discussion of values and and positions and really focus on let's let's make society better mm -hmm. yeah you know in the work that i've been doing with regards to the school board stuff uh there was a constituent in a west valley school district who um because so just to give a little bit of background in the peoria unified school district we had a couple of board members who were um citing scripture to justify right. to justify their kind of hateful policy decisions okay. um and and there was a constituent from that district who reached out to me and said i have been a you know an evangelical christian my entire life i was raised in the church and she was essentially having a crisis of faith because she said you know wait a second what they taught me was that, you know, was were the teachings of Christ, you know, I'm supposed to love my fellow humans, right. I'm supposed to, and, but she was also raised to be incredibly judgmental towards her, you right. know, fellow humans, and as she got older and started to realize and, and, and work through this world, 
what she found too was that the the church that she had grown up in had completely rejected her and mm. she was just kind of a uh, you know out there trying to find like how can i it was almost like she was trying to justify how can i believe in this stuff anymore when the followers of this religion that i've adhered to my whole entire life are not only rejecting me but they're rejecting the teachings of christ and so there's a bunch of people out there i feel like who are who just feel lost you know they're in the ether and they don't know what to do and these more progressive i guess you know i i want to call them more christian organizations like like i said we work with arizona faith network frequently um and we even partnered um in tucson a couple of months ago with the oh my gosh lindsay might be able to help me here but it's you know it was amanda tyler and the work that she does with the um oh, the the i'm sorry i'm so not very well versed and but she is getting other more progressive religions to be like hey christian white christian nationalism is a problem the approach to these you know, issues that, are, that we're facing in society, it's a problem and their membership is growing every day. And as we know, people who don't adhere to a particular faith is also growing every That's single right. day. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So I do have a question here. Okay. This is from yes. Christine. Oh, wait, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Let me read it. Christine yes. says also, I think a perhaps misguided perception is that housing will be used by religious organization at, organizations as a platform or a way to recruit new members. That's right. This seems to stem from the same idea of the Salvation Army uh, alternate sentencing program sometimes turned down by convicted persons because they don't want a religious perspective in their alternate sentencing environment. It is something I've heard anecdotally. Yes. So, Okay. No, I think that's that is true. I agree. I think the whole question of uh, the, the, the proselytize, the, the danger of proselytizing, and what's the role of pros? I mean, I think that these are the debates. I mean, I frame that into in the, the religion secular kind of pluralism, and I think that what I was trying to show in that slide with the during different courts, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, was uh, uh, the, that. I mean, this is an ongoing discussion. It's a contested and ongoing discussion. And that it has to, it's a learning process. I mean, it's a, it's a social, it's a learning process. And we, we need to, ex, when, what the, the, like, the, this, when you, the, 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 the faith based initiatives program that was rolled out during the Bush administration, but it was actually passed during the Clinton well reform, welfare reform act. I mean, that was the, those that resisted the, the role of faith-based organizations as social service delivery providers feared the question, well, how are, th their role is not to proselytize. Mm -hmm. And that is a debate that needs to take place. And I think it has the courts, there's a, it goes through courts and jurisprudence and society also has to engage in these debates. I think that's one, one aspect. You see, I think that that has, you see what, what we're doing now is moving into kind of cultural issues and discussion. I, what I was focusing on was implementation. So what from, like, is there a way of, of somehow putting that aside and seeing how we can collaborate with organizations that you want perhaps organizations suspect of proselytizing. I mean, this is this is the 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 question that I think is uh, is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Lindsay's uh, just citing an example from you know where she is in Washington. She yeah. says an example from where I live. There's a religious organization that provides almost all the services for unhoused populations. Right like almost all services in town, but as right. a Christian organization, they discriminate in their hiring practices based right. on their religious beliefs. They won't hire LGBTQ, right. non-Christian right. people. Many don't right. want tax dollars going to this organization, but there's no organization 
other organization providing these yeah, services. That's a, that's, these are serious. These are difficult issues. I mean, the, re, there's a long history of religion jurisprudence in the states along around these issues, and they're ongoing. And it, I mean, does one have faith in the, the the judicial system to 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 work through these and in the 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 checks and balances that we have between the different uh, the judicial system and legislate the legislature? These, I mean, these are these are difficult. These are substantive issues that any open democratic society is going to face, and. I think that there's a difference. There, we, we need to distinguish between the very important kind of aspect of individuals discussing these things, which it has its place, and that's what an informed citizen has opinions about it, and the fact that these are issues that are related to systems. Yeah. So how do they go through the systems, and how? Because there's a long tradition that's fascinating, and I, I think it's fascinating of the this the the twinest the two uh, religion clauses of the U.S. and the whole kind of notion of uh, of uh, the certain kind of one can say the the right of religious organizations to discriminate if it goes against their kind of religious views. This is this is something that's very interesting given the the work of secular Arizona, but I think I mean it's I mean there are it's it's fascinating, you know. It, it I would say it's fascinating and also infuriating. Okay, you know? <laughs> that that as well, right? <laughs> was, um, I'm Chris, interested to hear your views on because given secular Arizona, I mean, I I I I understand. I read you know what the work you're doing, so. I'm interested in because that what is unique, one of the unique role things, what is unique about the one of the unique aspects of the US is really the, the unique role that religion has played. And um, you know, it's an ongoing change. You mentioned the 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 increasing, you know, it's secular, we're secularizing at a very fast rate. There are a lot of religious nuns just mm -hmm. skyrocketing. So that's also kind of happening. So I, I just uh, it's it's a very unique legacy. It it is, and I you know? like, and and because we live in first of all, we all live in the worst timeline ever. I feel like <laughs> I'm a Gen Xer, and I remember you know my yeah. my formative years being really blissfully like ignorant. I didn't have to worry about anything, and now suddenly right. like all of us are plunged into what is happening and. But I but I do think I I I continue you know and and it's my unique position but i continue to see pushback against these you know this kind of ideology or and especially with the youth i am so inspired by the millennials and the gen zers because they're the ones who overwhelmingly reject like this kind of status quo well you know you go to church on sunday you do right. this tithe and That's and right. we expect a miracle they don't, but they don't have any miracle. The That's Gen right. Zers in this world, they don't have any miracles. They're, you know, facing lower wages, higher housing costs. Right. I mean, the number, I, I was just texting with Lindsay, um, our development director about right. a former student of mine. You know, she's about the same age as my daughter, probably 23, 24 years old. And she reached out to me on Facebook and was like, I'm getting evicted. And I was like, oh, my God, that's terrible. And I tried to point her in the direction of all the places that she could go. But I certainly, I, you know, what am I going to do? I can't I can't help her in a meaningful way. And I've been following her saga on Facebook. And, you know, she's gone back to the abusive home where she grew up. And that that breaks my heart. Right. And it's just it's it's a terrible thing. There's a couple more comments here. Let uh, me, yes, let's let hear me them. See. Um, Christina says the, I don't know what she's referring to exactly, but she says that speaks directly to implementation though, either it's neutral in execution or it's not the spurring philosophy may be religious and secular, but you're either obligated to say grace before the free meal or not. Boy, is that true? Mm -hmm. And that's one yeah. of the things like, you know, like we we got an angry comment on our Facebook for having you as a guest. It was very interesting to me because this individual was like, you know, you all you religious people are basically trying to, you know, grift 
the our unhoused neighbors into worshiping the god right. of choice you know but but what i tried to say to that individual is like look we're just trying to find solutions we're That's trying right. to you know, stop that from happening no, um, yes, i think uh uh, Dennis says this discussion emphasizes the polarization of religion. Sorry, yeah. No, it, this this, <laughs> this is a this is a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Penelope says there is also a problem that most people in the media don't understand the nuances of religious differences, so they don't realize when religious organizations are involved in implementation phase. That's what, right. What a great comment. Yeah, that's a great comment. That goes to the whole culture wars aspects. Yeah. In what ways is it amplified by certain media and certain establishment figures? Either you know. Yeah. I, know. I think that's there's a lot there. Yeah. When we when I first came on into this organization in the fall of 2021, um, we we have this program where we have our secular stars, right? Like people who stand up to um religious bigotry in all you know phases and forums or whatever and there yep. was a local journalist who was doing really because think about this this is like you know 2020 2021 so covid mask mandates right. school closures you know virtual learning and people were crazy about like putting their kids back into school without thinking about the effects of it and there was a local reporter who was really focused on that story all throughout the Valley. And I reached out to them and I said, Hey, we would really like to honor you with a secular star award for the work that you've been doing at school boards. And he rejected it because really? he, said, he said, I wouldn't want to alienate my religious, like, you know, fans or followers or whatever. Uh -huh. I was like, buddy, this has nothing to do right now with religion we're just saying you're doing a good job on your reporting and you're standing up for like right. so it's so divisive it's still for some people i think it's a generational thing though i really feel like gen z is going to save us all <laughs> mm -hmm. um let's see there's another one from john john says all humanists should welcome the help of fbo's but not at the expense of denying basic human rights like, for example, a woman's right to birth control. Right. I refer to the simple solution of world poverty, give women control over their reproductive lives and a few seeds. Um, and then Mars says, I'll wrap it up with Mars because it is 758. If you can stand up and speak out, say you are an atheist. Amen. No pun intended, Mars, but amen. <laughs> I'll proudly say that we're atheists, humanists. Yes agnostics, whatever, say you are a secularist, talk about it as much as religionists project their faith into the world. Wow, what a great parting shot, Mars. That was fantastic. Yes. So with that, uh, Manuel, um, what is what is your hope? You know, you're somebody who is absolutely entrenched in this. You've devoted your life's work to it. Where can all of us on a Friday evening going into the weekend of Labor Day weekend, like get some hope where we feel like there's a change coming and 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 we can feel good about that? My hope is 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 that we need, I mean, there needs to be always questioning of absolutes and questioning of ways of doing things and you know, argue. Uh, th there's always a learning process. We always learn in a, through conversation with one another. Uh, kind of, kind of absolutist kind of positions really are anathema to kind of moving forward as a society. We need to find a way to to dialogue and difference, put those differences aside, and kind of uh, collaborate to solve concrete problems affecting our lives affecting our neighbors lives that's kind of the hope that i have right on well thank, thank you. you so much for joining us i'm thank so you very glad. much for the invitation i'm so glad that we were able to finally you know get a day yes, thank and, you and i hope that we've been able to introduce a bunch of our members to the work that yes. you do thank and you very I much i enjoyed the conversation thank, thank you. you all right well i hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and um take care be take safe care. out there 
All right. Bye.